the floor is yours. I suppose to start off, I have to apologize because I will be presenting this in English. I'm afraid my Greek is absolutely horrible. But in an attempt to make up for it, I brought some uh, <laughs> maklava from Turkey. So. Start with the heel, the stem, and the stern post. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right, good. We would start with the heel, the stem, and the stern post. And the next step would be to simply start adding some or most of the internal framing to that structure. Now, the framing played a variety of roles. On the one hand, the framing created a certain amount of structural integrity. But what's important to this discussion is that the framing also created the shape of the vessel. Now, in antiquity, the process was slightly different. You heard some of these details. In antiquity, after assembling the keel and the stem and the stern post, the next step would be to add some or most of those external planks on the outside of the ship. Now, the ship, now those planks created a certain amount of structural integrity, and we know that they used these things. You just heard about them. These mortise and tenon joints. The shipwright would use these to attach the planks together, edge to edge. And by doing so, the planks also played other roles. The planks created that waterproof structure. And more than that, it was the planking that created the shape of the ship itself. Now, that little technological distinction is important. Because once it was clear to historians and archaeologists and classicists in the middle of the 20th century that there was this technological distinction between ship construction in antiquity and the way we would build a ship today, it meant that a number of very simple questions came up. The first of which is when did this change in techniques take place? When did shipbuilders stop using the old method, and when did they start using this new method? Another question is, how did this change take place? And more importantly, why did this change take place? Now, these questions are key for the presentation I'm giving you, really because these are the questions that led to the excavation of many of the ships that I'm talking about today. Very basically, many of the ships I'm going to talk about were excavated in an attempt to answer those questions. How did this change take place? Why did it take place? And, and when did it take place? Now, as I go through this presentation, I'm going, to present, I'm going to present these sites to you in the order that they were excavated, not the order in which the ships sank. That means that it will appear that I'm going back and forth through time, from the 9th century back to the 4th century, and so on and so forth. But I'm presenting the information in the order that we as archaeologists collected it. Because by doing so, it gives me the opportunity to demonstrate that as we slowly gathered more information about this technological change, our model of this technological change became a bit more complex bit by bit to the point where today, this technological change is actually quite complex. It's not a straightforward, simple thing. So that's one thing I'm going to talk about. But the other thing I'll address briefly at the end of this presentation is how people are a part of this technological change. And as I go through this presentation, it will appear that this simply seems to be a shift in methods a shift in which ship, shipwrights went from doing one thing to doing another. But very fundamentally, there's also an issue of the way that the shipwrights were thinking about the ships, the way that they were thinking about them in their head. And so at the end of the presentation, I'll be talking about that as well. 
So the first site I want to talk about is one that you've actually just heard a bit about already. This is the site from Yasada. This is a ship from the 7th century AD. It was excavated between 1961 and 1964. Now, fundamentally, this ship is important today really for two reasons. The first reason is the date of the excavation. This ship was excavated at the very beginning of maritime archaeology as an academic practice. When this excavation was completed, the discipline was less than 10 years old. So as this excavation was taking place and as it was finished, it demonstrated to other archaeologists and historians that professional archaeology could take place underwater that it was possible to apply these archaeological techniques on a shipwreck underwater and pull out the same sort of important data that we can find on land. Now, what's also important today is actually, oh, it's entirely disappeared. Huh. That's, that's interesting. Well, I'm going to use a little interpretive dance. Uh, Basically, what's also important today is the hull material that they found from the 7th century ship at Yasada. They found about 20 to 25 percent of the hull preserved on the seafloor, although it's not in this slide. And what's important about that hull material is that they found those mortise and tenon joints in this ship. This is a ship from the 7th century AD. Now, what's particularly interesting, as you just saw, is that the mortise and tenon joints in this vessel are much smaller than the examples from the Roman period. The examples from the Roman period are quite big. They're solid. They're robust. They're very close together. They have pegs locking the tenons together. But the examples from the 7th century, which I apparently don't have a picture of, are actually much smaller. The, the tenons from the 7th century ship are about 3 to 5 centimeters wide. They're spaced about 35 to 50 centimeters apart. And more than that, there are no pegs holding them together. So by the middle of the 1960s, what we knew about this technological change was just starting to take shape. In the Roman period, these mortise and tenon joints were big and solid. But yet, by the 7th century AD, by the Byzantine period, they were much smaller. They were insignificant. They were not playing a key role in the strength of the hull. Now, the next ship that was excavated, I know you've just heard some bits about this as well. This is excavated in the late 1960s, and it was also done at the same place, at Yasada. This is a site off the western coast of Turkey in the Aegean. And as they excavated this site, their knowledge and our knowledge of this model of technological change became more complex. Oh my gosh, there's more stuff missing. <laughs> well, they found about a little more hull material on the seafloor. In this case, about 25, maybe 30% of the hull was preserved. But Unfortunately, due to a fire in a conservation lab about 20 years ago, most of that hull material was either burned or it's actually now encased in a giant block of, of really a conservation chemical. So we only have rudimentary information about the hull material itself, really just one or two publications. But the mortise and tenon joints that were found in this vessel are this interesting transition between the Roman examples and the Byzantine examples. The examples from this, the fourth century site at Yasada are slightly bigger than the examples from the Byzantine period. They are about five to seven centimeters wide. They're spaced from about 15 to 30 centimeters apart. And similarly, they have those pegs in them, locking them in place. So if all my slides keep working, which they're not, can we hook my computer up to this? Is that possible? <laughs> okay. Let's see. Yeah, please. What's that? 
I'm, I'm actually checking. I think, yeah, all the others are there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> This is exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, no, like, like pictures aren't there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, huh. Can I? No, I can't draw with a marker, can I? <laughs> no, that's not going to work. What's that? Yeah. I think it's only like two or three pictures that aren't working. All right. Well, anyway. Yeah, I'll have to describe it. I'll use my hands a lot. Regardless, uh, by the early 1970s, in the excavation of this site, which is from the 4th century AD, by the time this excavation was finished in 1974, our model of this technological change was taking some very clear shape. And basically, luckily, we saw most of this picture previously. By the middle of the 1970s, our model of this technological change was rather straightforward and linear. These mortise and tenon joints were getting smaller and smaller and smaller, century by century, century, bit by bit by bit. So it appeared to be this straightforward, linear process. We could almost predict what was going to happen next. So we had this very interesting period of transition in the 7th century AD, we had mortise and tenon joints in ships that were very small. But we also had information from textual sources in the 14th and the 15th centuries that indicated that ships were built in a relatively modern way. So something happened in this period of time. Something happened between the 7th century AD, when ships were being built in the older method, and the 14th or 15th century when ships were being built in a newer method. And it was that particular question, it was that interest that led to the excavation of this site. This is a shipwreck off the southern coast of Turkey. It dates to about the 11th century AD. It was excavated in the late 1970s, between 77 and 79. Now, in a way, there are also two important reasons that this ship is fundamentally key. On the one hand, there's the cargo. This shipwreck contains the largest collection of medieval Islamic glass ever found in antiquity. It's an incredible collection of stuff. If you ever have the opportunity to go to the Bodrum Museum of Underwater Archaeology in Turkey, you can see where most of this glass has actually been reassembled and put on display. You can also see more pictures of the octopus that didn't want to give up all the cargo on the seabed. But what's interesting about this ship is that it does not just contain Islamic material. It also has Byzantine coins and Islamic coins. It has Byzantine weights and Islamic weights. It even has a chess set. So right here in the 11th century AD, there's this ship that appears to be traveling and working between the Byzantine and the Islamic empires. Even if these groups were opposed to each other politically and militarily, it appears that economically they were all getting along. Now if you go to the museum in Bodrum, you'll also have an opportunity to see the hull material because it has been conserved and stabilized and reconstructed you can see how it, the original ship may have looked. Now, as they reconstructed all that material, this is actually a cross-section through the ship. As they reconstructed that material, they found no mortise and tenon joints in the external hull planking. Fundamentally, this ship from the 11th century AD was built in basically a modern way. The frames were in place first. The planks went on the outside second. So our model of this technological change by the early 1980s still appeared to be rather straightforward. It was going in this nice, clear, linear path. Everything was getting smaller and smaller, and by the 11th century AD, the mortise and tenon joints were gone. But by the 1990s, things began to change our knowledge of this model and its shape began to change radically, really for two reasons. The first was this excavation. This was the one I worked on for my PhD research. 
We worked on this site between 1995 and 1998. Fundamentally, we wanted to excavate this site because of its date. It's from the 9th century AD. Presently, our best date for the vessel is somewhere between about 840 and 850. So it falls right in the middle of this important period of time when this technological transition is taking place. We have the Yasada ship from the 7th century, which has mortise and tenon joinery, and we have the Serce Lamana vessel from the 11th century, and there's nothing there. So this ship right in the middle should give us an idea of what was happening. Was it built in the older fashion, or was it built in the newer fashion? Basically, what did it look like? Well, my job for my PhD was to answer those questions. I had to figure that out. And so part of it was simply creating the entire hull itself, putting it all back together. And for those of you who can use AutoCAD and Rhino, I had to do all of this by hand. <laughs> Is anyone else here working on their PhD right now? No one's working on their PhD? Well, if you do, take every opportunity to talk about it later, because no one will ever ask you about it. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, my job was to look at all of this whole material and figure out how it was built. You know, what, were there mortise and tenon joints? Was it built in the modern way? Basically, what happened? Well. As I deconstructed the hull and tried to understand this, I found no mortise and tenon joints in this ship. This is from the ninth century. There's no mortise and tenon joints there. What we found instead, however, was something very unexpected. Rather than mortise and tenon joints, we found these pegs driven into the edges of the planks. You can see one of the pegs right there going across that piece of wood. Here's another one, basically a schematic drawing of it. Now this was unexpected. We hadn't seen anything like this before in the archeological record. So what Bosebrun began to tell us is that perhaps this technological change was not so straightforward. On the one hand, we could look at this and we could say that, well, the shipwrights were getting really bored and tired. They were tired of using hammers and chisels to make all those mortises. They were tired of shaping all the tenons. Instead, they simply took out a drill, they drilled out holes in the edges of the planks, hammered the pegs in, and off they went. But on the other hand, I also know that the ship was built in a modern way. These five frames were assembled first. The shipwright who built this vessel put down the keel, the stem, and the stern post, and he put in these five frames next. So what is very interesting about Bosebrun for this model of technological change is that it's giving us an idea that things may be a bit more complex. It's not just this linear, predictable pattern. Here we have a shipwright using a method that we had never seen before. And more than that, he's combining it with another method of assembly, and we thought they didn't fit together. But yet, here he is doing it. So Bosebrun is one key excavation in the 90s that began to question the way this technological model worked. The other key excavation is this one at Tantora Lagoon. Now, Tantura is an interesting site. It is one of the few natural harbors along the Israeli coastline. That makes it a rather key spot for all of these ships. Now, for our purposes, Tantura is also interesting because they found a number of shipwrecks there. Here's one of those shipwrecks. Here's another one. And basically, they found about four or five shipwrecks right there in the harbor at Tantor Lagoon. And to give you an idea of scale, that rectangle is the size of a basketball court. So this is a lot of archaeological data in a rather small space. And regarding this technological model, these ships date between about the 5th or 6th century AD to about the 9th or 10th century AD right when shipwrights are apparently changing methods. Now the ship from the 5th century AD was built in the way we predicted. It has those mortise and tenon joints in them.
But the ship from the 9th or the 10th century has nothing. There are no mortise and tenon joints in the 9th or 10th century vessel here. There are no pegs in the edges of the planks from this vessel either. So again, Tantor Lagoon is making us question this technological change as well. It appears that the rate of change off the Israeli coastline, or perhaps in the Eastern Mediterranean, is going much faster than what's happening in the Aegean. The sense of the linearity of the model is just gradually pulling itself apart. Now the last site I'll talk about is one that doesn't exist, it is, well, that one. It's the site of the Theodosian Harbor in Constantinople. Now I think you're going to hear more about this later, so I won't dwell on it a great deal. But fundamentally, if you're not familiar with this site, I highly recommend you look into it. There is a great deal of hyperbole about the excavation at Yenikapa in Istanbul. How great it is, how amazing it is, and honestly, it's all true. This is an incredible archaeological site. When they say this is one of the most important sites in Turkey in the 21st century, it's not a joke. This is an incredible site. There's material here from the Neolithic period all the way up to the Ottoman era. Now, what's different about this site, which you can't tell from this picture, is that this is actually happening on land. And this started as a rescue excavation, unlike the other sites. Basically, the Istanbul city government wanted to expand their subway system. And you know what happened in Athens. Well, the same thing happened in Istanbul. They went to a neighborhood called Yenikapa, which means the new gate. And as they began to dig out the foundations where they're going to build the new subway station, and as all of these people ignored what the historians and the archaeologists were saying, they found the ancient Theodosian harbor of the emperor. And they started to lay all of the concrete pilings right through all of the ancient wood. Now in 2003 and 2004, because this is a harbor, they found two, maybe three of these ancient shipwrecks right there in the mud. By 2012, when this rescue excavation had more or less finished, they had found 35 to 37 shipwrecks there in the mud in the ancient Theodosian Harbor. And these are just shipwrecks. If you can think of everything that you would associate with a harbor, you can find it here. There are dead bodies, there are dead animals, there is a church, Apparently, there's a rumor that there is a bag of human heads. Um, there are sands, there are shoes, there are rope, and there are 37 shipwrecks. And all of these shipwrecks date from about the 5th or 6th century AD to about the 11th century AD. And the preservation at this site is amazing. This is actually a small example. This is about the side of one of these boats. This is what is much more common. I mean, this could have been made three days ago. This site is probably from the 7th century AD. This gives you an idea of how amazing this material is. And there's just more and more and more of it. Now, prior to the excavation at Yenikapa, we had no ancient galleys from the medieval period. We had nothing. Now we have four of them. We have merchant vessels, we have local vessels, we have international vessels, we have galleys. It's an incredible collection of stuff. And what's interesting is that they all date to this key period of time when this technological change is taking place. Now unfortunately, because the excavation of this site finished just recently, in some cases, we don't have a whole lot of data. Very basically, this is the plan of those shipwrecks. <coughs> the site actually extends a bit farther to the west. There's one or two more over here. But very basically, I color-coded these shipwrecks. So, all of the shipwrecks that are in blue are ships that were made with those pegs in the edges of the planks, just like Bose Brun. All of the shipwrecks that are red have mortise and tenon joints in them, just like those earlier vessels from the Roman period. 
all of these ships that are gray, we don't know yet. We, they haven't finished the research on them. Those ships that are in gray could be built in a very modern method. They could be built with mortise and tenon joints. They could have the pegs in the edges. Right now, we simply don't know. Has anyone ever worked on an archaeological site this big? Anyone? Yeah, this is going to take decades to finish. So don't hold your breath. But fundamentally, what's important about the material at uh, Yeni Kappa, as well as the material from Bozbrun and Tantora, is that our, they're making our model of this technological change much more complex. They're demonstrating that the rates of change are varying in different parts of the Mediterranean. Off the coast of Israel, things appear to be moving faster. In the Aegean, things appear to be going more slowly, but yet, yeah shipwrights also appear to be trying out different methods in different ways. They're using pegs in the edges of the planks. They're combining them with other techniques that we hadn't seen before. And more than that, we don't know what's happening in the Western Mediterranean. We don't have a whole lot of data from that area. So our model of technological change went from something very simple in which the mortise and tenon joints got smaller and smaller and smaller, everything was straightforward and simple, to this model, which is now much more complex. And from my point of view, that's a very important thing to remember. Because the complexity of this technological change in the past is very similar to technological change today. When we're looking at changes in computers or cars, we can see that it proceeds in a variety of different paths, in a variety of different ways. Sometimes it appears to not go forward at all. And we know that the change is very weird and random today because people are involved. Some people like new technology, other people don't. And so I would propose that the change in antiquity was equally complex because people were involved in it in the same way. Some people wanted new ideas, other people didn't. So this change in technology in antiquity was also very complex simply because it was a cultural phenomenon. Now there's one more thing I want to emphasize, and that unlike today, this technological shift also took a very long time. Whereas today we can get a new computer every year, in antiquity, it appears that this change in technology, this shift from one method of construction to another, may have taken 50 years, or 100 years, or 200 years. And what I also want to emphasize is that I think this change took a long time simply because the shipwrights had to do more than adopt a new method of putting stuff together. The people building these boats also had to think about a new way of conceiving of the ships, of thinking about their shapes. If you remember, at the beginning of this presentation, I talked about how the old method of ship construction used the planks first. That's what you heard in the previous presentation. But if a shipwright is doing that, then the shipwright is using the planking to create the shape of the vessel. He's using a longitudinal element to create a longitudinal shape. But if a shipwright is building the vessel by putting the framing in first, then he's doing something very different. He's using a transverse element to make a longitudinal shape. That means that whatever method was in place in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, whatever method was there to control and to predict the shapes of the planks, it could not be applied to the frames. An entirely different method had to be in place. And so I think that this change in methods from the older technique to the newer one took a long time because the people building these boats had to come up with an entirely new way of controlling the shape of the vessel as well. Now, what is fun about the Bozbrun ship, I just showed you this picture earlier, is that the Bozbrun ship from the 9th century AD appears to have evidence of this process of control, the way the shipwrights predicted the shapes of the frames. Now, like most archaeological endeavors, we found this evidence by accident. I was uh, documenting the midships frame. Now, the midships frame, if you're not familiar, is commonly the biggest 
and the widest frame in the ship. It's usually the most important one. Commonly, it's the one that dictates the entire shape of the rest of the vessel. I was documenting the midships frame for my PhD, and I found something called a scribe mark. Anybody know what that is? Any guesses? OK, I'm going to make something up. Basically, imagine if you're simply giving instructions to someone. You would mark on a piece of wood, cut the wood here, nail the wood there. A scribe mark is when a carpenter uses a sharp tool and he marks the wood. He simply gouges into it. I found one of these marks on the midships frame at a place called the turn of the bilge. And the turn of the bilge is where the bottom of the ship turns and becomes the side of the ship. I found that mark right where that turn begins. And just for the curiosity's sake, I measured the distance between that mark and the center of the ship. Now that measurement was 1.72 meters. Yeah, today I'm 1.72 meters. In antiquity, that really means nothing. Assuming that the ship was symmetrical from one side to the other, then the ship is about 3.45 meters wide. Now again, that measurement on its own really has no importance in antiquity. It doesn't have a cosmological significance. But when I found that measurement, I also knew that there are other methods of building boats in vernacular ways that use the width of the ship and multiply it by various numbers to determine where to put other parts of the boat. They use multiples of this to determine where do we put the keel, where do we put the frames, so on and so forth. And because I knew that the midships was one of those five frames that was creating the shape of the vessel, I took a chance. It turns out that if we take the width of the midships frame and we multiply it by one and a half, we get the distance from midships to frame 16. If we multiply this number by 1.25, it's the distance from midships to frame L. If we take that measurement and we have half of it, it's the distance between midships to 5 or midships to E. Basically, it appears that the shipwright had done something like this. He was controlling and predicting the shape of the vessel in two ways. The first was controlling where these key frames go along the length of the ship. And he used very simple proportions, half, one and a quarter, and one and a half. These are numbers that are easy to create, they're easy to remember, and they're easy to teach to someone. The only one that doesn't make sense is the one you're probably looking at. It's that one. It's the weird measurement between midships and the next frame, midships and number one. It's not a simple proportion. It's not as if the shipwright went half, quarter, one-eighth. The shipwright used a tenth of this measurement. And that's a weird thing, because it's not simple and straightforward to create. All of these other measurements can be created with a piece of string, but one-tenth is a weird number. So to understand what I think this very small measurement of 34 and a half centimeters represents, I have to talk very briefly about how craftsmen in antiquity measured stuff. In antiquity, craftsmen basically had three different measurements. They had the finger, called the digitus, they had the palm, or four fingers, and then they had the foot, and the foot was four palms laid side by side. Now those are all common names, but the actual measurements they create are all different because a craftsman creates his own feet based upon his own hands. If he has hands that are seven centimeters wide, he's going to make a foot that's 49 centimeters. No, let me do the math. What is it, four times seven? Thank you, 28 centimeters. <laughs> If he has hands that are eight centimeters wide, he's going to have a foot that's about 32 centimeters long. What? Did I do it right? Okay, okay, good. So what I think that small measurement represents is the foot that the shipwright made as he was creating his vessel. The shipwright made his own standard base length 
of 34 and a half centimeters because as he put his four hands together, that's the length he created. And if we use this short measurement of 34 and a half centimeters, we can then make all of these other proportions. Here's one base length, here's five, here's five, 12 and a half, and 15. And what's interesting is that the shipwright may have used this measurement in other ways on this vessel as well. As I said, the shipwright has to control the shape of the vessel in two ways. He has to control where these frames go along the length of the ship, but he also has to control the shapes of the frames as well. He has to predict what they're going to look like. And I'm proposing that this is how he did it. Now, I think Costas, I think you're familiar with this drawing? Yes. As I think you know, there are a variety of ways to make the shape of a ship. We can use computers. In antiquity, or rather during the Renaissance and afterwards, other people would use complex mathematics. They would make arcs and curves with all kinds of tangents. But in more traditional or vernacular methods of construction, people would actually use a set of physical molds. This is an example from 19th century Greece. It has five different parts. And the shipwright who's building the boat is able to manipulate the molds in a variety of ways to make the shape he wants. He can control the height of the frame above the keel, the width of the frame, the curves, so on and so forth. What I believe the shipwright did who built the vessel at Bosbaroon is that he used these two molds to make those five frames. One mold controls the height, the other mold controls the breadth. And it's possible that he used multiples of that base length of 34 and a half centimeters to build these molds and to predict those frames. Now very basically, the breadth mold at the top determines the width of those five frames. He would align that little mark on the mold with the center line of the ship. And he would then know that the, the frame has to be that wide. And he has different sets of marks to do so. And as you can see, those different marks on the breadth mold are all multiples or divisions of this base length of 34 and a half centimeters. This one is 2 thirds. That's two of those measurements. That's four. And that's five. And then I also think the shipwright did something similar with this rising mold. With a, a series of very simple multiples of that base length, he could dictate how high the frames rise above the keel. And to give you an idea of this process, this is what I think happened. The shipwright would start off with really just the trunk of a tree. And he had one branch sticking out at one end. And then he cut the entire thing in half lengthwise. So it opened out. And then he has all the wood exposed to himself. And then the shipwright started off by making a, a vertical line, which is the center line of the ship, and a horizontal line, which represents the top of the keel. And then he would take the rising mold. This is step two. And with the rising mold, he would then create two other horizontal lines. Those lines would determine how high the frame rises above the keel, as well as the thickness of the frame itself. And then he could use the breadth mold here in step three, and he could determine how wide the frame is that he wants to make. Maybe he's making the midships frame, or frame five, or frame L, or frame 16. He has all the marks on the mold to do that. He could dictate the curves, and then he can actually flip the breadth mold over and create the curve of the frame from the keel going up to the flat part. Down here in number five, this is the projected shape of the frame on the wood. And here in number six, this is the projected shape, and this is the shape of the midships frame that we found on the Bosbrun vessel. So they really fit rather well. And it's possible to adapt this method to the smaller frames on the ship. It's basically the same thing. You just need a smaller piece of wood. You set up the three horizontal lines and your center line, and then you align your breadth mold. You determine where the curve at the bilge begins. 
the, you then determine the inclination of the frame, flip the mold over, there's the curve from the keel, and then you basically have your curve of the frame. And all of this is built upon that base length of 34 and a half centimeters. It all just fits right together. So what's interesting here is that the shipwright who built Bosbrun clearly had this method in place to control the shapes of these frames. He could control their shapes in this fashion, and he could control their distribution throughout the ship with a related method. It's all built upon this set length. That's kind of similar to the Byzantine foot. Now what's really nice is that this method could also be applied to this ship. Do you remember this one? I know I actually had a picture of it. <laughs> this is the shipwreck from the 11th century AED. This is the ship at Serci Lamana. This was the vessel built in clearly a frame first modern way. It's possible to take this method of control and prediction and apply it to the preserved remains of this ship as well. And ultimately, we can create this ship with the same method. We simply have a slightly different length because a different person built this boat. So to finish up, I should apologize that all, not all my pictures were there, but I also want to emphasize that fundamentally, I think it's always important to remember how the people are interacting with this technology, how the people are changing throughout time, and how sometimes people change quickly, other times they change reluctantly. But it's also important to remember that as we as archaeologists look at all this material stuff and we say there's this change in technique, there's this change in style, very often these changes can take a long time simply because people have to start thinking about these objects in a very different way. And what I think Bosbrun demonstrates is that by the 9th century AD, shipwrights had come up with a way to actually think about the ship in a new fashion. They had worked out a new method of controlling its shape with all of those frames. So before this computer blows up and anything else disappears, I should probably stop there. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.